everyone, welcome back to the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel where we bring modern medicine to strength and conditioning and strength and conditioning to modern medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum, and this is training vlog number 35. This is our recap of the 2019 USAPL Raw Nationals held in Lombard, Illinois. So for this vlog, we've got meat footage from Lorraine Baraki, Sam Calhoun, Charlie Dixon, Leah Lutz, and Claire Zai. So what we'll do is we'll take a look at all the footage that we have. Uh, sometimes we'll use the announcer's commentary if it's relevant, audible, uh, and good. If it's not, you'll hear me narrating, trying to set the scene. Uh, and then we have some other cool stuff uh, intermixed. And at the end, there's a this or that uh, section where Dr. Baraki and I go back and forth on some user submitted questions. So hopefully you guys enjoy that. Without any further ado, let's get into it. My name is Lorraine Baraki. I am a captain in the Army and I'm also an OBGYN physician. I have been powerlifting for six to seven years. My husband, boyfriend at the time in medical school, Austin, I think we all know, um, was teaching himself methods of lifting weights after he finished college. Um, we met in medical school and as he was learning more, um, it just piqued my interest to learn how to move a barbell around. So. Um, started to get some exposure with that through him, essentially. Recently, depends how you define recently, but if we think about this time last year, Nationals last year, um, since then I have completed my um, OBGYN residency after four years, um, and I've also transitioned into being a staff OBGYN um, currently in Fort Polk, Louisiana. Um, it's been marked by pretty significant schedule changes, for sure, um, being on call in the hospital quite frequently. Uh, but I actually see it as a positive thing, surprise, surprise, um, just because my life's become kind of regimented. I'm either at work or I am leaving work and training or I am resting, recovering, refueling to do it all over again. So it's not a lot going on in Fort Polk, Louisiana. Uh, but in your numbers have been good pretty well in training? Um, they have been going pretty well with my bench specifically. Um, my squat and deadlift have held steady, I would say. Um, I know that I have more room to, to grow in both of those. I have some kind of waxing and waning low back pain that I've been consistently working through. Um, and so that's played a little bit of a role here recently. What would your walkout music be? Um, well, I have an English choice and a Spanish choice. Oh, great. So it just depends. Um, but my English choice would probably have to be Tatiana, Blueface Baby, featuring Cardi B. Um, <laughs> and my noted philosopher. And then noted wise philosopher Cardi B. Um, and then my Spanish choice would probably be Hector Lavo, Mi Gente. That's also my favorite song. Yeah. My people. My right. Yeah. Name. Yeah, yeah. Same, same. Yeah. We'll show them. Let's just see. See what happens. See what future me does. All right, so this is prime time day three. It's the first night we were there, Friday night, 63 kilo women's class. This is Lorraine Baraki, opening squat attempt. Now, what they did for prime time is basically take the top uh, seven or eight or something like that uh, lifters in each class and put them together so that they would all be on the same platform competing together. It actually made for really nice viewing experience. This was the only platform going and you could see her on all of the uh, background videos. So uh, very cool. So this is 150 kilos, 331, smokes it. That's what you want your opener to look like. About RP7, when we say that, it means like easy opener. Alternatively, uh, if you were trying to pick a weight for this, it'd usually be something you could do for a comfortable triple. Uh, particularly this weekend, they were being very, very uh, harsh on depth, which is good. That's what you want at a competition of this level. I think they had like 1,300 competitors, and so you'd want the judging standard to be very, very high. So anyway, she moves up to 155 kilos. This is 341 in the American. Gets the squat command. You'll notice what she did there. She, take, she took two breaths, one out of the rack and then one after the squat command. I'd probably wait to take the breath till after the squat command, but uh, no problems here. So she moves on up 160. Again, this is under her best uh, you know, squat. I don't think her training was actually 
uh, going too well uh, for this and some of the interview uh, that we had before this I actually uh, asked her about that and you know it is what it is and uh, 160 would be a good number for her so let's look at this one gets the squawk command takes that second breath yeah, and she, it looks like it almost got a little behind her. And it's weird, before they uh, she actually stopped moving the bar, they took the bar. So theoretically, she could have retaken that weight if she wanted to, but Austin decided to waive it because she'd rather have a, a bigger deadlift and not fatigue herself on another lift. So uh, moving on to the first bench, it's 97 and a half, which is a monster bench. So uh, it's 215, smokes that as her opener. She was one of the heavier benchers in the class. We'll watch it on replay, comes back off the chest. Very nice, very nice lift, Lorraine. Uh, and they were very expedient about getting the weights changed. So this meet moved uh, pretty quickly, actually. As you can imagine that a meet with, uh, you know, something like 1,300 lifters uh, would have to move in order for it to get done over the course of uh, four or five days. So yeah, now you can see her grip. It's a pretty moderate grip, especially compared to her, you know, competitors. And uh, she's very, very strong. So this is 102 and a half, 225, the bro weight, two plates. Gets the bench command. She sees takes a breath after that, long pause, and yeah, smokes it, drives it uh, back off the chest very nicely. Three white lights, all, all systems go here. And so she's gonna go up on her third. We can watch this second again in slow-mo. Again, really cool when they did this for the primetime uh, meets, uh, the, the primetime lifters. Uh, it's nice to watch again. Uh, right, and then Lorraine on her third bench, this is 105 kilos, uh, 231. Gets the handoff. Now she's got to wait for the bench command, or the start command. Gets the start command. Yeah, she probably had 107 and a half, but that would have been a, a you know hit or miss. 105 went up nicely. Very good bench. I believe that's a PR for her. So now she's got to move into the deadlifts. Uh, you know, with her subtotal, she squatted uh, 155 and then uh, 105 there. So she's uh, right at 260 kilos for her subtotal. Open it up 165 kilos, 363, smokes it. Uh, see if they give us a little replay for this. And no replay on this one. Uh, okay, moves up to 175, so this is 385 pounds. It's cool, uh, watch this pole. Yeah. A little, a little bit off her legs off the bottom, but no problems. Her dad was actually sitting right behind me, just going crazy. It was really cool to watch. Yeah, she holds her back in a great position, then gets the bar back on her legs, smokes this 385 pounds at 63 kilo body weight or 138 pounds. Very impressive to watch. Now up to 396, again, at 138 pounds. Also, she's a, a doctor, <laughs> which is awesome. And I think, you know, for my money, she smoked 180 faster than 175. What's the, what's the recap? <laughs> recap is they have gacho pepe no, no, no. on the menu and I'm about to get it. Uh, how'd the meat go? Meat went very well. Are you happy? Obviously. Are you satisfied? I'm satisfied. Oh man, I was really gonna hopefully that you were gonna say no so I could do an Alexander Hamilton reference in there. but okay. I'm elated. Perfect. Yeah. Very cool. Well, say goodbye to the YouTubes, you <laughs> deuces. Cardi B, out. <laughs> so Lorraine had a pretty solid day. She came in feeling very confident on her bench. Her bench training has been going awesome. Uh, squat and deadlift, we've been making do with her uh, kind of some back aches and pains that kind of come and go with training intensity, life stress, sleep stuff that seemed to make it flare up, but ended up putting up a uh, 440 kilo uh, total, which is five kilos under her best total from when she was actually heavier. She was two kilos underweight for this meet. Uh, All-time uh, meet PR on the bench with a 231 bench, which uh, is pretty good, very good for that weight class. Um, and squatted uh, 341 on her second and just missed her third and then pulled 397. Uh, so I think that our plan moving forward is going to be to get her back symptoms kind of desensitized, ease her back into things, build up her training volume again, and then I really, I mean, her potential is really high on the squat and deadlift. She's nowhere near her potential there. I think she could probably get up to squatting, you know, 165. She could probably get up to deadlifting, probably get close to 200, I think is possible in her future. Um, just has to be a matter of training, getting her to tolerate enough training to get there. So that's what we're gonna be working towards with her. Sam had the meat of her life. Uh, she, her prep for this, uh, this meet, we experimented with some different approaches, particularly on her deadlift training. 
uh, and things seem to go really well. Easy. Smooth. She hit uh, all-time uh, PR on the squat. All reds on the bar. That's that's a pretty load. All, All reds the way. With a oh, chip. geez, that was so easy. And she squatted 391 or 177 and a half kilos, uh, which went up fat faster than any of us expected. So that was awesome. Uh, she benched a meat PR of 107 and a half kilos. So if she gets this today, this will be a two and a half kilo PR for her. Struggling at over 100 kilos. <laughs> well, if you look at her meat history, the oh, left. nice lift. Look at that, PR for Samantha, nice work. We've been benching 105, 105, 105 at multiple meets, trying to get a few more kilos on the bar, so finally got that done. And then she ripped a 226 American record, unofficial world record deadlift. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, we are live from Lombard, Illinois. 2019 Raw Nationals. All the way up, Sam. Come on. Holy crap. Sam just took, let's wait for the white lights, but three white lights and Samantha's walking ahead. Uh, to seal the deal for an uh, all time uh, a PR total of 511 kilos at about 62.7 kilos body weight. Um, so incredible meat. Really, she has matured a lot as a competitor. Her mindset, her preparation, her uh, just everything about her has uh, come together really well uh, to be able to perform at this level and repeat as national champion. So we're very proud of her. I'm very, very happy with how the weekend went. Both Lorraine and Sam did a, did a fantastic job. And uh, we've had a bunch of other awesome performances from our, from our folks, including Charlie and Leah and, and, uh, and lots, of, lots of other lifters on our team. So uh, we're happy, we're proud. Charlie Dixon successful on his first, 290 kilos. Got called for depth on his second, so let's see if he can nail this one and get that 307 and a half. Charlie with his SPD equipment. All the way down, let's get it. Oh, nice. It moved fast, so let's see what the judges have to say about that. He is credited with 307 and a half kilos on his third attempt. We have Charlie Dixon up now, but I just want to 205 out kilos. That look at this beautiful green on his meat history here. Oh, drives it all the way up. Keep, keep with that today. Gets the lift two to one. Anyway, that was an amazing uh, there attempt was some, there regardless. Was some hitching. There was some hitching in there for sure. I mean, just sticking with it though is... Hey, gotta fight, gotta, gotta fight. fight. We're Charlie, all here because we fight. Charlie, 332 and a half. So Charlie Dixon with 332 and a half. So he's also... Oh, he makes that look easy. Easy, easy. That is under his best. Oh, so however... Referees, three white lights. That puts him in second place. So that is uh, absolutely amazing. That's probably why they made that call. That was a Silver medal winner, Charlie Dixon. All right, Saturday morning here, Lombard, Illinois. Leah Lutz, Claire Zai, set to do battle today. Lorraine, Sam, and Charlie all did extremely well last night so we're just gonna walk over to the venue now meet leah for this morning session try to grab some breakfast some <laughs> something for my voice because i've been screaming my face off and uh, yeah it's gonna be another good day for uh, barbell medicine and all of our athletes great part about having breakfast with leah lutz is she will be impressed with your breakfast order because you're the epitome of health uh leah we're here before your your uh, session are you impressed with this order Oh, I am very impressed. I mean, I'm a little unimpressed with the amount of cheese on that omelet, but you can afford that fat. So That's right, but it, they are egg whites. Exactly. And exactly. then I got the steel so cut you, oatmeal. Right, and it's got nothing in it, so <laughs> it's acceptable. Solidarity for those who have to <laughs> Thank <you>. cut weight. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Sam.
So my name is Leah Letts and I am a coach with Barbell Medicine. I also make sure Barbell Medicine runs behind the scenes, so we don't want to forget that. <laughs> so I've been powerlifting for six and a half years now, I think. I think this is my fifth Raw Nationals now. Numbers I hope for tomorrow. So a bunch of people ask me this on Instagram and I wouldn't tell them. Um, <laughs> right, but yeah, this is for the tubes. Uh, I. Big goal is I want a fairly sizable PR total this meet, um, and I'm excited about that. So <clears throat> I will be really excited if I hit a squat 157.5, bench 90, or in the back of my mind, I think I could do 92.5, but that may or may not be in the cards. And then <clears throat> I hope for my biggest pull ever in the 170s. I'm Leah Lutz, wish me luck. So now this is day four in the morning. Leah was in a morning session, uh, platform five. She was the last flight in the morning session because uh, they were lifting the most weights. That's how they did it. Masters one class, opening up 142 and a half kilos. This is like 313 pounds. Gets a squat command, takes her breath. Yep, moved real quick. Uh, so I wanted to put her in a position to take a PR third attempt. So I had to pick 152 and a half. She got one red light on depth on the side, but you know, sometimes it do be like that. So we were not worried about that. She's uh, never gotten called on death and a meet. And so we moved up to 152 and a half. Plan was for 157 and a half on her third. Gets a squat command. And obviously you can't tell depth from this angle, but you'll see they actually gave her two red lights from the side on depth. Center judge said it was okay, which is usually how that goes. So we retook it. Uh, wanted to get this 152 and a half uh, a kilo on the scoreboard. Gets the squat command again. And to me, it looks like she buried it, you know, and uh, got a little out of position, was able to, to stick it. And then now she's get two red lights, one from the front on depth, which is very odd, but yeah, it's out of our control. Can't control the outcomes here, only can control the process. So regrouped. So she opens up here at 80 kilos, smoke show, 176 uh, pounds. Um, you know, not too long ago, she actually had a, a slap tear repair surgically and she couldn't even bench, you know, the pink dumbbells. So very impressive to see her come back for this. 85 kilos, smokes that, it's 176. And now we're gonna go up to a third. This would be a, a meat PR here, 90 kilos, 198 pounds. You can see me creep in in the background. All day. Yeah, 90 kilos was the right call. 92 and a half, you know, it might have been a little too much for the day. And a big celebration, nice meat PR, 90 kilos. All right, moving on to deadlifts. And so uh, this is 160 kilos, 352 pounds, smokes it, no problem. And what we were doing, we're doing a lot of math on subtotals to see how can we get Lee on the podium. Top five is a podium uh, position in the 72 kilo class, or in all these classes. And so had to do a bunch of math and try to figure out like, what do we need uh, to pull? And so I bumped her up to 167 and a half. This is 368 at a 72 kilo body weight, masters one division. And uh, yeah, from here, I was like, you know, 170 would be a really easy third, 374, really solid third, but we had to go up more than that. I was thinking maybe 172 and a half would be like a limit third, 175 was gonna be pushing it, but that's what we had to call for to get her, uh, to get in that number five position, to get a medal. So we took it, you know, uh, 172 and a half and 170, I was 100% I was sure of 175, created a, a little bit of drama. So let's, uh, let's watch what she does. 385, nice. Come on, stick with it. Look at that. Patience, patience. That's that hard part. Is that skin <laughs> folds up right Locking underneath the, the singlet? Lock it back. Get Lock it back. back. <laughs> you can see me leaning back in the background. She gets the white light. She gets a good lift. All time meet PR, 385 pounds. Monster pull. Uh, great job, Leah. Great, great job. Moving on to Masters One. 72 kilo class by popular demand. In fifth place, Leah Lutz. Hopefully she's still here. Of Barbell Medicine fame, Leah Lutz. These are your Masters One 72 kilo champions.
So my name is Claire Zai. I'm a competitive powerlifter and a researcher. I was in grad school and one of my friends, I was always a gym rat, and one of my friends recognized that I had some competitive numbers and kind of enticed me with uh, some uh, records and said I could break some and went out and caught the bug and never stopped. I started barbell medicine a little over a year ago doing group, group programming and then I ended up switching to one-on-one -on -one programming right after California State Championships, which was about three months ago. At my last meet, I totaled uh, 452 and a half kilos. And this meet, my goal is to go nine for nine. And I don't know, I think at 475 total is my goal for this meet. So. Good evening and welcome to the primetime session for the 72 females and a 105 males here at the USA Powerlifting Raw Nationals 2019. All right, so this is uh, day four primetime session, Claire's Eye 72 kilo open class, opening up here 157 and a half kilos, 346. Again, notice she had to take two breaths. Uh, always wanna take the breath after the squat command. And uh, yeah, they actually red lighted her on depth again from the center judge, which is odd, but you know, that happened. So we retook it. Uh, really want to get on the board and not uh, uh, tempt the barbell gods by going up, even though she's much, much stronger than this, as you can tell by the bar velocity. Uh, so basically, I told her, hey, take your breath after the squat command, make sure to bury it, and then uh, you'll be you'll be all good. Now, watch what happens when she walks the weight out here. So in order to get the squat command, the two side judges have to drop their arms, basically signifying that you've uh, locked your knees out. And so the side judge you can see in this frame never drops his arm. So they make her re-rack it. Clock's still running. All right, so you get a minute to take each attempt. So she has to basically do this whole thing again and lock her knees out. I, uh, I would be interested to know what was going through her mind when this was happening. I and mean, this has happened to me before, but you know, you just regroup and go ahead and do it. Gets the squat command. Again, really fast rep, very strong lifter. And uh, yeah, she gets... Uh, two to one, that's a good lift, moving up on the third. So already we were in a kind of a precarious position uh, based on what we had done in training. So went to 165, really wanted to just increase her total. She buried this one. And again, two to one, that side judge just not loving her. But we're on the board with her third attempt at 165, 368 pounds. So now we'll move on to bench press. So this is 97 and a half kilos, 215 pounds, 72 kilo body weight. Gets the star command. Now notice she's got a much wider grip. Also notice me in the background with no hat. Apparently you can't wear a hat when the, from the coaching <laughs> platform, but uh, three white lights, so all systems go here. Uh, moved her up to 105, 231 pounds. And uh, she gets the star command and let's watch the bar velocity on this one. Yeah, so from here, 110 would have been a match her best in the gym and would have been a, a all-time meet PR. So we went there again, a little more aggressive than we wanted to be just based on uh, what she did on the squat and then just gets out of the groove and the bar went too far back, actually hit the rack. So uh, unfortunately that's how it went, didn't make that lift, but uh, still in the mix for this podium position. Again, top five gets a medal. Uh, this is the biggest class all weekend long. Opens up here 385 pounds. I actually thought they might uh, troll her with that little movement at the end. I wanted her to kind of, you know, hold it and at, at lockout and be a little bit further behind the bar, but uh, no problems. They gave it to her and uh, it was a good lift. I'm gonna move up to 185, 407 pounds at 72 kilo body weight. Watch her pull this. Yeah, again, good velocity. And uh, I had a lot of number crunching to do in the background. I actually changed her third deadlift attempt twice. So 185 was good. Had to change her third deadlift twice to get her in position to pull for that top five position in the, again, largest class all weekend. That's men or women. So she goes to 192 and a half. This is a 423, I believe, off the top of my head. Uh, originally wanted at 190, but uh, had to bump her up and then bump her up and uh, back down. Um, so I originally put in 195 on her first change, then 192.5 to make the other people uh, take their third deadlift up. And uh, yeah, she smokes this. Nice pull. This is for fifth place. And uh, her, yeah, her first Raw Nationals gets a fifth place overall. The open 72 kilo class, fifth place, Claire Zai.
So, okay, uh, this is the this or that section. This is the this or... I got trapped in my own sentence structure. So basically what we did is we asked you guys and gals on Instagram to submit this or that style questions so that me and uh, old Baraki here can uh, battle it out. Vincente Monte. How do you think you say that? Vicente Monte Montesac. Uh, he asked chicken or beef. I think I eat chicken more often, but I probably like beef more. I, yeah, I feel the same way. Yeah. Which actually does tails nicely <laughs> into our upcoming podcast with uh, Alan Flanagan on red meat intake. And uh, we cover a bunch of different stuff, uh, basically red meat intake recommendations, um, saturated fat, dietary cholesterol, the diet heart hypothesis. We go deep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think if I had to pick one for like tastiness, I'm going to pick the beef. Yeah. Uh, in particular, an A5 Wagyu <laughs> cut. <laughs> uh, but if I, what I eat more frequently is chicken. All one SS asks, uh, safety squat bar or hack squat? Oh, I'm gonna pick safety squat bar squat. Same, yeah. Just because I prefer squatting to doing like uh, machine-based exercise, but that's just me. If you asked me like, should somebody do a hack squat or a safety squat bar squat? I don't care. Yeah, for what? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we've covered this, just the benefits of like freestanding uh, movements tend to be, you do train your balance on some uh, component and then usually there's more global muscle mass involved, but that may not be a concern if it ultimately prevents people from adhering to training. Yeah, so if the question is, you're using this in a program for somebody who trains like a barbell athlete and they're squatting on some day of the week and you wanna introduce something else on a different day, safety squat bar versus hack squat, there's no automatic answer to that that I would give that right. I, where I would feel strongly about it if they you yeah. know if they want I have I have actually a few clients who hack squat in one slot yeah. of their uh, of their of their week uh, and then others who don't do any kind of machine based stuff for it hack squat or belt squat this is the same thing <laughs> <laughs> you just overwhelming shrug yeah, yeah, yeah. all right okay natty 24 run a marathon or do a bodybuilding show oh bodybuilding show I mean like I don't like being hungry and I don't like shaving, <laughs> yeah. you know, but I hate, I don't like running long distances that hurt me uh, even more. Yeah. So lesser two evils, I feel like. Probably if this was like uh, 10 years ago, I probably would have just done the marathon. Just because I would have been in, in sufficient shape to do it. Uh, at this point, the amount of training required to do a marathon would be substantial yep. uh, versus, uh, there's no specification here as to how well you'd have to do at the box. Yeah, you could so literally you just get do up it. and be completely unremarkable on stage and uh, tick that box. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Yeah, I guess they don't have like a, a quality like right. control yeah. checkpoint. <laughs> so just like go up there and it's like that. Uh, it's like a meme of a dude who just this like chubby looking dude who got up next to Larry Wheels. Or yeah, whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. On the, on the... Uh, do you think, okay, to take this one step further, do you think you'd be better bodybuilder or better marathoner? It's hard to judge the competitiveness in something like bodybuilding, of course, just because of the nature well, sure. of, the, of the sport, I suppose, um, in terms of, you know, who shows up and the subjectiveness of the aesthetic or whatever. Uh, I mean, knowing that my endurance background, I was decent at it. I think I'd be decent at marathons, but it, I think it may take longer than a year to get good enough at it. <laughs> Transfer all those previous adaptations over <laughs> yeah. that you've likely either lost or tucked right. away somewhere yeah. to another sport. Yeah. yeah. I think I'd be a better bodybuilder. Not that yeah, I'm like probably. particularly aesthetic, but yeah. you know, I'd be training the arms. No. Yeah, that makes one of us. What do you do for arms? <laughs> I'm like, not, not, like have them? <laughs> <laughs> Pivot block or traditional deload? These are just labels. Right, yeah, they're just made up. Uh, and what does traditional deload mean? So like, if you're defining that as when people, you know, would say, oh, I'm gonna only do 70% for like a reduced volume, so reduction in intensity and volume. I mean, that's kind of what a pivot block is. Um, you could make an argument that a, uh, some iterations of a pivot block actually have uh, less discrepancy in the volume, um, but the intensity usually is significantly lighter, meaning that you, know, you were previously doing like heavy sets of five or threes or something like that, and now you do a week where you're just doing tens. So the intensity is lighter, the volume may be similar, but, and the movements the, tend, tend to be different. I think that's probably the bigger thing in terms of the way people think about these is yep. the exercise selection stuff, but these are just words. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> word, words matter. Like, I don't know that there is such thing as a traditional deload unless you just go by the literal definition of deload and you just decrease the load. Yeah, sure. That's the only traditional way that I would view it. And, you know, I don't, 
again, I don't think that there's one that's better than another. It's kind of a, uh, depends on what the person needs. So for example, if somebody is complaining of tons of uh, accumulated aches and pains that I think are, you know, the result of, uh, you know, over accumulation of fatigue or something, yep. I'm probably not going to switch them over to a block where I just like switch the exercises, bump up the reps and keep the intensities at like nine or 10 RPEs. Sure, yeah. Um, I'm definitely going to pull back on the load, uh, decrease the load and hence maybe I'd use a traditional deload e. in that sense versus another situation where somebody's like maybe feeling fine, but their response to the training is kind of waning and uh and or maybe there's some psychological stuff where they're not enjoying the training as much anymore and i might switch them to something where they're doing different movements different rep ranges that they haven't been exposed to that they can pr new things get excited about training yep. but they can still tolerate high intensities so i don't care for the labels for either of those things it's just different ways of of altering the training based on the response yeah yeah i think that context uh those those examples that you mentioned are uh, I feel similarly, like those, those are good rules of thumb. And then also uh, I, when decreased specificity is actually warranted for the particular goal that you're programming around and that is important, then I think you can uh, use pivot blocks or pivot weeks more uh, liberally. So, but you know, for example, if people are going into a powerlifting meet and you know, you're three weeks out or four weeks out and you're you know, changing training just a little bit and you need like this lower fatigue week, um, that's mostly more going to be a traditional deload. Yeah. That's how I tend to program it. But if I'm separating different blocks that are have similar goals, they're both developmental blocks or GPP blocks or whatever, I tend to use just a pivot where movements are different, the rep ranges are significantly different. It's kind of like a washout um, in, in a way. Uh, or if people aren't going to a powerlifting meet, I tend to not use the traditional deload as much uh, unless they're really geeked out on testing their 1RM. All right, this is from Annie Palladino, our friend from Pacific Northwest. Oh, we have, a, she has a bunch. Okay. Yeah, this is a foursome. Uh, now teeing off. Not that, like the golf. What was the question? All right. Star, <laughs> Star Trek or Star Wars? Uh, I guess I've not seen like enough of either to call myself like a Trekkie or a Star Wars like person, like, you know, fan. Yeah. So I'm just going to say Star Wars because I've seen, I've definitely seen more Star Wars and I think uh, George Lucas did something really interesting um, that had never been seen before at the time when he came out with the original Star Wars. Yeah, I've seen all the Star Wars multiple times, so I'm gonna go with that. You're, I think Star Trek is not for me. Not for you, <laughs> you're, you're gonna pass. Pour over or espresso? Pour over, easy. The espresso is the pre-party. Everyone's like, what's your coffee order, man? I'm like, pour over with an espresso on the side. And you get the espresso first, because it doesn't take as long to make, right? And then it's your pre-game, and then you have yeah. a main event. I'm gonna go espresso. Nope. If I could get like a mug of espresso, I'd be perfectly <laughs> satisfied with that. I think the 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 odor and the uh, the tang of it, uh, I really enjoy. Uh, have you ever done like a coffee cupping or tasting course? Oh my gosh! So they make you like slurp the things. You're like, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's why I don't think I could do it. No, yeah, the slurping is like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they're like you're aerating your palate, so you get all these notes. I'm like, I just feel like a fool. But anyway. <laughs> uh, beach or mountains? Um, beach. Well. I, yes, I live by the beach, but I also am not far away from mountains. Thank you, California. Yeah. And you pay extra for that yeah. <laughs> to put you in the, that location. But if I had to pick one or the other, I'm going to pick the beach. Yes. Grew up at near a beach and mountains are oh, you did. places that tend to be colder and snow, which I'm not a fan of. So, sure. Uh, yeah. Versus more temperate stuff by water. Phil James, pull sumo or squat high bar for the rest of your life? I'd probably just pull sumo. I don't. I don't particularly dislike high bar, but if I had to pick one or the other, I, w I would probably just pull sumo because I find that to be more comfortable than I do squatting high bar mm -hmm. as my dominant squatting movement. Uh, what's your best high bar for like a single and then for reps? I actually don't know that I've ever done a high bar single, mm -hmm. but I could probably high bar, like when I was at my strongest low bar, I wouldn't be surprised if I could high bar squat in the probably in the mid 500s or so. I could probably sure. high bar 550 or something then, if I had to guess. Yeah. But I was low barring 625 then. Yep. Yeah. I have high barred 500, mm -hmm. no belt, yeah. and no knee sleeves. That was my no, no, no. Yeah. I felt like the Mike Milo poster. Yeah, right. And then uh, I did 195 for 10. Okay. Which is 430, I think. Reps. Yeah. It's just two sets of five, really. Yeah. <laughs> Tim. Doritos or Ruffles? 
Hmm. Did we get to stipulate the flavor? Because I'm trying to remember what ruffles are. are those the ones that with are like ridges. The no, dude. The, no corkscrew. You talk about like bugles. Yeah, no, those are the no, those are triangles are, things. Bugles. I, I did enjoy those. That's yeah. Let me look up what ruffles look like. Ruffles have ridges. In What's them. their? That's their like slogan. But. Yeah. So there's like a, it's like a potato chip with ruffles. So look, here's the thing. If I could pick the flavor, I'm picking ruffles, uh, uh, sour cream and onion. Okay. But my favorite potato chip is gonna be salt and vinegar, and they're Lay's. Salt and vinegar are pretty good. Yeah. yeah. But he said Doritos, so it didn't have to be Cooler Ranch. Yeah. Not the cheddar. No. Those, those get those get old too quickly. I All think. right, Cooler Ranch Doritos or sour cream and onion ruffles. I think I'm gonna pick the Cooler Ranch. Yeah. Although I, the correct answer to this question is, is Lay's salt and vinegar. <laughs> <laughs> Costco hot dog or IKEA meatballs. Oh. I don't like I don't like meatballs. Just neither. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've never had either, but I don't like meatballs, so I'm gonna default to the hot dog. Yeah, I've never had a Costco hot dog. Yeah, and I've been to IKEA once in my life. So oh yeah, yeah. I've never been. Lorraine underscore Barbell Medicine. Hey, you know her? Yeah, I know her. Puerto Rico or Cuba? <laughs> <laughs> uh, like. I wish there was more to this, like to visit or like which like foreign government do you work for or like. <laughs> uh, have I, you been to Have you been to any Caribbean islands? I've been to Puerto Rico. You have, yeah, yeah. Um, I'd go back. Yes. Also, well. I could move there if I live there more than I think it's forty percent or fifty percent of the time. You can like qualify as like a Puerto Rican, uh, like that you live there mm. and get a tax break on that because oh. you're <laughs> moving a business. So I pick all of that over. Uh, Cuba. Not that I think there's anything wrong with living in Cuba right now. I just, yeah. I like the amenities yes. of Puerto Rico. Cuba, uh, Puerto Rico was a great time when we went there. Uh, and I also would like to go back, but um, we haven't had a chance to. And there was the whole hurricane business that decimated there. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that, that's a thing. That was a problem. But that's actually a yeah, problem. Mofongo is where it's at. CNS fatigue or adrenal fatigue? Well, only one of these things actually exists. So, and, and CNS fatigue really is a misnomer as far as how it's actually stated. You call it central fatigue, which effectively means that the amount of uh, neural stimulation that is transmitted, the, like little electrical stimulation that's transmitted to the level of the muscle is decreased. And this is a protective mechanism so that you don't go into the red zone, into the danger zone. Um, that's contrasted to peripheral fatigue, which means there's actually something wrong with the muscle. The nerves are sending the same signal to the muscle, but the muscle goes, nah, dog, I'm out. Yeah. Uh, so that's a thing. I wouldn't call it CNS fatigue. I would just call it central fatigue. If we have these two broad, um, like big umbrellas, big buckets, central fatigue, peripheral fatigue. Uh, and adrenal fatigue is wholly made up. Yes. You can have adrenal insufficiency. Yes. That's a thing. That's a real thing. Yeah. And like requires... As objective signs, symptoms confirmatory lab testing that is validated that's re yeah reliable <laughs> validated and requires like medical intervention yeah people you know so actually life-threatening yeah so the adrenal fatigue thing um yeah it, you can't just tell people though that it doesn't exist like that's the wrong way of going about counseling that's a good way to backfire people <laughs> right exactly just like telling people that their low back pain doesn't exist yeah. like don't do that yeah. um so there's you know different ways to counsel this but yeah as far as we know right now based on evidence um and evidence exists to basically suggest that this is a wholly made up condition and the treatments for this condition that are um, you know, uh, uh, advised are completely made up, baseless stuff. Um, although, you know, the lifestyle stuff I get behind, like sleep more, sleep more, yeah. make sure to eat a healthy diet, you yeah. know, whatever, whatever they want to define that as. But I, going around telling people they have adrenal fatigue or they're overstressing their adrenals or whatever, it's like, nah, man, that's why they're there. Yeah. Literally there yeah. to deal with stress. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of these kind of reductionist to the point of being wrong things. And then the CNS fatigue thing, it always kind of cracks me up because I think about like real things that could be labeled as such. The oh. best example being like a postictal state after somebody's had a seizure. Oh, yeah. So after people have real true like epileptic seizures, they're usually pretty drowsy for a, for a decent amount of time yep. afterwards. And that's called a postictal state. And I always think about that as like true because they're brain just kind of electrically fried itself. It's literally fried itself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> catatonic <laughs> states. Yeah. You're just, you know, but, uh, you know, people, Gunshot people wound. Say that they're, they're, they're frying themselves from doing a few sets of squats is kind of amusing to me in that right. sense because you don't collapse post-ictal like you do after a seizure when you've done that. No, usually not. Usually not. Javin asks, flats versus heels for squats. I don't care. Yeah. I mean, I probably like to use a heeled shoe, but uh, it doesn't matter. But when we go train in like an hour now, 
I'm gonna go squat in Same. these sneakers. Well, I brought my nanos. Yeah. Because it's open season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's fine. Don't care. Uh, doing mobility drills every workout or never be able to squat again? Is this question a threat from Squat You? <laughs> <laughs> Where do you get your evidence? <laughs> yeah, got you. Shots fired. Uh, if it's more than like 30 minutes of mobility, I'm just saying I'm not willing to sacrifice that much of my life just to squat. Sure, I would yeah. just start entering push pull meets. Go do other things. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So 30 minutes is my cutoff. Yeah. And that doesn't mean you should do 30 minutes of mobility, like you shouldn't do any mobility. Just when, when I say doing mobility, just don't do it. Yeah, you can do like dynamic movements that are specific to the task you'd like to gain more range of motion in, you do that. And if you wanna call that mobility, that's fine, but that's not what other people mean when they say mobility. They mean rod wad. Or like the, these stupid warm up stretches that yeah. activation drills. <sighs> Long sigh. A world without nocebos or a world without anti-vaxxers? Uh, well, I think the death toll would be better if there were no anti-vaxxers. And I don't mean that these people, like, I'm not, this is not an aggressive threat on them. I just think that they should change their mind and be open to actual, like, scientific evidence. This is an interesting question, because on one, it, this is basically a question of morbidity or mortality. Yes, correct. Right? Yes. Yeah. So you would reduce mortality. You would, uh, uh, yeah, again, save a lot of lives if there were no anti-vaxxers out there. Um, just to be clear, there's no scientific evidence that supports that line of thinking. Yeah. So when people start talking about, well, this person said this, it's like, yeah, that's not based on actual evidence. So gotcha. Um, but those people, these people aren't interested in actually having a yeah. discussion on the science. Nocebos though. I mean, you would argue maybe that the quality of life that does. Correct. Yeah. Be less morbidity. Quality of life would likely be improved. Uh, uh, and this is like when I go, I cite a lot of the Lancet's global burden of disease data and some of the talks that I give and uh, some of the stuff that I talk about leans on the mortality side where they have like rankings of the top causes of death worldwide. The WHO has their like top risk factors for mortality, like yeah. high blood sugar, high blood pressure, obesity, and activity. Um, and tobacco use are the top five from the WHO. And so, you know, in, you know, uh, uh, the, the vaccine topic and immunizations and stuff isn't necessarily in that top five. Sure. Um, so you think but they would, would reduce mortality. Yeah, I think they're just bigger, big, big, big targets. And so you could even make an argument that without nocebos, maybe some people would be less reluctant or, or have fewer barriers to engage in health promoting activities that yeah. they're afraid of doing and may be able to round about. Kind of interesting to think about. Yeah, I think I'd probably pick the, the world without nocebos thing myself. So yeah, so, well, you made your point. Yeah. I think I agree with you because initially I was thinking anti-vaxxers. Yeah. But I think maybe you end up causing less people to become anti-vaxxers without the nocebos. Yeah. Uh, hmm. I think that's it. Yeah, cool. All right. All right, cool. That's a this or that segment. Dr. Baraki, Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum. We're gonna get back to the lifting. Thanks for watching. I'm Tom Campitelli and I'm a barbell medicine coach. The, the question is, uh, how do I come up with the witty captions? And I would assume that you are talking about on my personal Instagram account, because again, I cannot confirm nor deny that I am involved with the Barbell Medicine Instagram account. But I will say this, uh, it often comes from the bits of detritus that are bouncing around my head during the day, uh, which through, uh, a process of um, great stupidity I embellish upon and add irrelevancies to until I have reached a character limit that is too big and then I'll dial it back a little.